Ovo je ovo. Ili će drugi ogonali ili na gida. Ponovio sta. Če je gidali u njega? Če je čeka magi? Če je ane gidu? Če je osahi? Osta. Hello. Good evening and welcome all our friends and relations. I'm White Feather. I am Chikamagi and Cherokee and also uh, Osage. Uh, welcome to our show. The lead-in song tonight was by Bo Taylor, Eastern Band Cherokee, and that's from his album, The Rebuilding of the Fire, and that was our welcoming song or a greeting song. For people who do want to call in this evening and have questions for our guests, the number is area code 718-506-1564. Again, that's 718-506-1564. You may also uh, reach us by our website. Uh, my little brother Jimmy is there working the board, and you can uh, comment and leave messages there, and he will let us know uh, here on the, on the program itself. And here is our co-host, Doreen Bennett from Aotearoa. Kia ora, Doreen. Kia ora, Masha. He mihi atu kia koutou katoa, and greetings to everyone here today. And I am really looking forward to tonight's guest, Masha. Been, um, he's been, people have been talking on the media website mm -hmm. uh, about Hawkstorm coming on tonight, so it should be fun, and it, I'm sure he's got a lot to tell us. Our guest tonight is Robert Hawkstorm. He's Sachem of the Shattakok. Did I pronounce that right, Hawk? Yes, Shattakok, yes. Okay, and uh, he's our guest this evening. Doreen and I both have uh, been have met him, and he's been on our show before as um, as a group, part of a group. But all three of us were in uh, New York at the United Nations for the Indigenous Peoples Forum. And uh, that, that's where we all really met in person. Um, apparently, he and I have heard of each other through other mutual friends, but we had never met. So why don't you introduce yourself, Hawk, and tell people all about yourself. We can start with in the beginning, eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, um, <clears throat> my name is Sachem Hawkstorm, I'm of the Scattercook people, in, uh, originally in New York, now in uh, Connecticut, um, and uh, I'm very glad to be here. I apologize for saying um so many times. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about, what you're, uh, about your people and uh, some of the things that you're doing up there. Hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Our people are from the last remaining tribes of the King Philip's War. Um, all the remaining Mohican tribes, River Indians, and and people of the Dawn, of First Light out on the uh, East Coast in uh, the United States ended up over in upstate New York during the end of the King Phillips War, coming together um, and joining Scattercook, which the true meaning of Scattercook is the mingling of waters, um, which they did a treaty together and decided that all the tribes would come together and work as, as one to survive. So the treaty was the Witten Admach Treaty and they all became Scattercook. So I'm actually uh, a descendant of uh, King Phillips, who was my, he was a great uncle. Uh, Massasoit, who was the, the uh, Grand Sachem over on the coast, who met up with the pilgrims when they first came uh, and helped them through their first crop. Uh, after they landed and almost died out through the winter, um, all the way to uh, Gideon Maui, who was who was Sachem that brought us over to New Scattercook from Old Scattercook, 
down into Connecticut. And, uh, yeah, our, our family has been, um, from the Royal bloodline of the Algonquin people from, from the beginning. Oh, okay. Ow. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about, I know, I know you were posting online and, uh, your people are fighting something right now. Um, why don't you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, about the land? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our um, our reservation is in Kent, Connecticut, uh, or borders Kent, Connecticut, and New York. Um, originally, it was founded in 1743, and it was all lands west of the Housatonic River going into uh, from the Hustonic River bordering New York, uh, from New Milford, Connecticut, all the way up to uh, into New York. So we're looking at a few, quite a few thousand acres at that point. Um, we made a uh, land agreement with with CLMP in. 2004 would have been 99 years. It was a 99-year lease agreement from them, and they uh, they um, had control over 3,000 acres uh, adjacent to the land that we've we've held on to since. Um, and to, in 2008, they filed a quick claim deed on that property because their lease agreement ran out in 2004, which means they did not have any land deed or title on that land previous to that. So in two, in 2008, they filed a, uh, a quick claim deed, which just in, in, uh, in legalese means that they have a vested interest in the property um, because they've been working that electric plant uh, since, since for, for over a hundred years. Um, but according to the, uh, laws directly you know just easily directly through connecticut um you can go back to um 1986 i believe it is and in 1986 it's i'm i'm trying to i i know that a lot of people are listening to this so i'm trying to get it exact because i know that i'm going to be question on this um, so so the land so the land is uh after you, after you filed the, the quick claim deed is that what you called it it's called a quick quick q u claim deed Okay, uh, and that was filed by? It was filed by CLMP. So CLMP filed that in 2008. But it, according to the laws of Connecticut, uh, the laws on Indian tribes in Connecticut, no no native can sell and no other can buy any lands that are held in trust for Native Americans. So this... This land deed was only established in 2008. So, according in in so well before that, this land had no title to it. It was it was considered Scattercook land. So this was um, and I'm I'm trying to find the exact thing here. What is CLP? Is that Connecticut Light and Power? Connecticut Light and Power. What they did was they built a dam. Where we we have the river. So they they built the dam, flooded out our graveyard when they built the dam, moved the, moved the, our remains to a different spot, Ooh. and um, and ended up uh, they didn't even they they charged us electricity the whole time on our reservation as well. So it's supposed to be a lease agreement uh, for 99 years. Mm -hmm. 
And um, a lease would imply that they have also uh, given us something out of the deal, and they have not. That, that's um, similar to us over here, Hawkstone. Um, we had those 99 leases for our land. I think they were called peppercorn leases. And, and a lot of them are up now, but we were lucky enough as a tribe to, to put a claim in to get those tribal lands back to us as a tribe. So for us to get them back, we had to get them back as a collective. Now, we still can't sell them or buy them individually. They belong to the to the people as a collective, which still works. You know, oh, we, absolutely. We all, absolutely. That's right. We all have one foot <laughs> in each of the lands, but it's still, you know, collectively it's our lands coming back to us, or a portion. It's only a little bit. It's not, you know, most of our lands have gone, confiscated, stolen, and everything else. Well, so I, I, you know, uh, it's it's not that we want to get all these lands back. All right, um, this is this is the the issue that the the government keeps putting on us is saying that they're just assuming that all these properties that they've sold illegally from our from our lands to these to the average Joe who's working and has kids going to school with our kids and and all this stuff they think. They think they can scare these citizens by telling these citizens that if we get federal recognition, that we're going to take all their lands back, and we're going to we're going to kick them out of their homes, and and try to get everybody up in an uproar uh, against us. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and that's not the case. You know, we have we have uh, plenty of, plenty of state land that that was part of the reservation. Macedonia's, um, I want to say, two thousand acres. The electric company that we can we can definitely um, speak with. I don't want to say we we want to take the electric company because that's not really what we want. We want to come up with an agreement with the electric company, but we also want our land back. They have three three thousand acres that they're using and they're allowing people to hike and 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 uh, have campfires and stuff like that on and and telling us that we can't have our land um you know stuff like that they, they're they trying to make a business out of having a park over there uh yeah. you know and we have no recompense from from what they have taken from us and and forcing us to pay for electricity on the reservation you know these are things that can be discussed you know or i can file a title you know, but they're so, they're so worried that that um, about this stuff that they're saying that there are no native. You know, they're not going to recognize any other tribes in the state of Connecticut because we're we're worried we're going to take they're going to take all of our all of their land back and they're going to take and they're going to go and build a casino. Well, as, you know that regardless of what happens. After recognition, and 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 nobody's talked to me about recognition just because of things that have happened in the past. Um, you know, according to the state of Connecticut, we have all all the rights we need. Um, but as as far as um, you know, you can't base who a person is on whether you want to have um, a compact of gaming rights with with someone. You know, I can't. I can't tell you that you're not, uh, you know, Maori because, you know, if I tell you you're Maori, you have a chance of opening a casino. I, I mean, that's just wrong. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> you, <laughs> you are so polite, actually, listening to you because I, I think you're probably more polite than we are. <laughs> <laughs> We won't put up with it, but we're a smaller, smaller place, and we will gather together and we will march on Parliament. We'll do all of that, so that that first give back what's ours, and then we'll negotiate at a table where we're both equal. Yeah. Because at the moment you're not, are you? Oh, absolutely not. Yeah. Now, have these people that are arguing and are afraid that you're going to take their land and kick them out of their homes and stuff, 
wasn't it the <clears throat> the Seneca in up in New York that got lots of land back and the people were afraid that this was going to happen to them and the and the Seneca people said no you just go on like you normally do we're not trying to take your homes away from you with with, with what they did to us and you will just pay your taxes instead of paying them to the US government you pay them to our tribal offices but everything will remain the same and as far as I know, that's the way it, it has remained. But uh, the government was trying to get people riled up in that way uh, when that happened. And I, if I remember correctly, and this has been quite a few years ago, everything was in a really smooth transition. But, of course, when you have a change like that, the people who have lived there, like, say, for 15, 20 years and are not Native, uh, they, they do get scared. But I think that's a good example of where they really have nothing to worry about. And I guess the question that I have is that since you aren't federally recognized, that's are, right. Go back. Go back. Keep are, talking. Sorry about that. Okay. And uh, and I know I know that it, it's really hard to get federally recognized today because the tribes that are federally recognized. They don't want any other tribes federally recognized, whether they can prove they deserve to be or not, because they're looking at the at the money that they're gonna they think they're gonna miss out on. And this okay, is, I'm glad you brought that up. And this and this is a real problem because uh, what, what is it? We have 576 federally recognized tribes, I think, and uh, there's about. Uh, twice to three times as many tribes that are just as traditional, meet all the requirements, and are just as much uh, a tribe as the federally recognized tribes that aren't federally recognized. And all right, I'm glad you brought this up, Mashu, because this is a very important point that I go off of very much. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> First of all, I don't believe in federal recognition. I'm, I'm going to put you. that right out there. Okay. Secondly, I and and you know, if you've been in the UN and you've been working on indigenous rights, you know that if that you know federal recognition is just another tool for the federal government to cap control over the tribes in in this country and to divide and conquer and to divide and conquer big time. So the cool thing about Connecticut, let me explain this because this is this is something that I've been trying to get people to understand. <clears throat> okay. Mm. The great thing about Connecticut is that all the tribes in Connecticut, all right, the Golden Hill Pawcasset Reservation, the Pawcatucket, the Pawcatuck Eastern Pequot Reservation, the Mashantucket Pequots, the Scattercook, um, the Scattercooks, um, and the Mohicans all exercise the same exact rights. Same exact rights, yet there's only two tribes in Connecticut that are federally recognized, okay? Tribes, tribal powers, and reservation. Connecticut law, and let me let me give you guys the link to this. All right, if you guys look up on the Internet, it's, it's called Connecticut Law on Indian Tribes. All right, this is – this. Uh, is from the senior attorney, came out August 16th, 2007, um, old research report, or OLR research report, okay? This is this illegal binding laws in Connecticut. Now, <clears throat> according to the laws in Connecticut, all Natives, all Native Americans in Connecticut exercise the same exact rights as far as rights to uh membership they they uh we have control over saying who is a native american we have control over saying who can reside on our reservation we have control over who we can say is a tribal member now none of these laws say that i have that this person has to have 50 percent blood this person has to have you you can only be on council if you have this or that no, we are self-determinant. Mm-hmm. As far as we don't need federal recognition. We we have the 
the recognition, the original recognition from 1742, 1743, when we became a reservation in the in the Constitution State of Connecticut, that we have all the same rights as as federal, except one thing: the federal federal recognition. What I've found has alleviated some of your rights at this point because now they take you into into a trust. Now you're in a trust agreement. You're looking for a, a, you get a, a few extra quirks from the government. You get some handouts, but then you end up with a situation like the Oneidas have, where now they have to put the same exact state tax on their cigarettes. They have to they um, they owe taxes on their lands now, and they uh, and their land was just taken into trust. Twenty five thousand acres of Oneida land was just put into trust. Up in New York. Up in New York. Yep. How can that be? Uh, and, and they're they're federally recognized, correct? <clears throat> Absolutely. So now you have now. people. But you know, the thing is, that I I guess I don't understand how that happened because the government has no control, supposedly, over how a tribe works as far as tribal government and things like this. And yes, we have. Um, we have certain rules and regulations as they well, I'm not federally recognized, but federally recognized tribes have certain rules that they have to follow. Uh, exactly. So what's that tell you? Does that tell you you're sovereign? No. You're that, that's that's exactly follow. what I was going to say. Quit reading my mind. So, the, so, so they're not really sovereign at all. You're not sovereign if you're following the laws of a foreign government. Thank you. There is no such – that is not sovereignty. But I don't understand why they're having to pay taxes on Indian land. I don't. I don't know of another federally recognized tribe that does that. Now, when I lived up amongst the Ho Chunk, my late wife was Ho Chunk for about 30 years, and when they brought in the smoke shops there, they were on Ho Chunk land. But the road that went in front of that was a state highway. So the police, the state police, and the local police would be parked out on the road, and if you bought cigarettes on there, you had to either confiscate, you either had your cigarettes confiscated, or you paid a tax. And that okay. has to be a real nasty battle. I mean, there were guns and everything brought out over there, and it divided up the tribe into two factions. It did get settled, and they pay a very minimal Tax, I think, is what it is now. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure on that, so I can't say for sure. But I, I know that they that you can still get your cigarettes a heck of a lot cheaper at a smoke shop there as opposed to going to a local place of business. Hmm. But I don't understand how they can do that, and especially now your land is recognized as reservation land. Yes, our we actually have one of the oldest. Uh, Connecticut has the oldest reservations in the country. Ours and the Golden Hill are the oldest reservations in the country. So you have reservation status, which yeah. means, if I'm correct, by federal law, since you have reservation status, whether you're federally recognized or not, the fact that you have reservation status, that is um, that falls under the same categories, I'm thinking, as treaty land. We are a treaty tribe. Right, which means that anything that goes on within your land, the government has to confer with you, and your people have to agree. Yes. And that's, that's the perfect situation. And our, our, and our, our land's also protected under the Non-Intercourse Act, where, um, like I said, no native can buy it, no, no, uh, or no native can sell it. Because it's it's uh, as, as we were talking about earlier, it's it's held in trust for seven generations. Isn't that the way most most traditional most tribes who are run traditionally, even though we do have modern aspects to our government today, that's it. Uh, Native people don't sell the land because it belongs to all the people. You can like like what I was going to do when I lived in Wisconsin. I if I had lived there long enough to purchase my property. I could turn it over to the to the Ho Chunk tribe there, and it would be a part of their land base from time on to memoriam. But yeah. with the stipulation that my direct descendants would have the right to live on that property. 
Well, here's this is what I'm offering right now. The, uh-huh. And and yes, exactly. But this is what I'm saying right now to the people that are living on our property right now. And it is our property, and they know it. They all had to sign the paper that if we ever wanted property back, that they'd have to give it back. I've spoken to many of them. Mm. You know, this paper is there. You know, you talk to the town, they they act like it doesn't exist. But I've talked to actual landowners that are scared that they're going to lose their land if we become federally recognized, even though, according to all the laws in the book, that's our land. And we don't have to be federally recognized, and they know it, and Connecticut is freaking out. But my proposal to them is, is, as you said, just like the Seneca did it, you know, pay your taxes to us. If that if that property goes up for sale, it goes back to the tribe. But otherwise, your family can live there for the next 300 years. I don't care. Uh-huh. Good one. You know, if, as long as it's your family living there, you can stay there forever. Pay us the taxes, and and uh, unless you sell it, you know, you have no nothing to worry about. I mean, the, this state is scaring the crap out of these people. It, it's the politicians, huh? It's the politicians because they because they want that they want that uneasiness because that gives them an edge. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And you know what? <clears throat> You know, there, there's there's a lot of casino talk, all right? Everybody's worried about casinos and stuff like that. You know, honestly, we just want we want our land back. We, uh, you know, there's there's 3,000 acres of non-used land that's not going to displace anyone. Macedonia is 2,000 acres. There's there's um, 3,000 acres on the electric company. At least 2,000 acres of it is not being used. At least 2,000 acres of it is not being used. Right now, they're leaving us with 400 acres of rock. They have literally gone past our old, old Moravian Mission Church Foundation that started this reservation in 16 in 1743. That was built. You know, all the old foundations. I can I can walk the property and show you where all the old foundations are, and they have literally gone a mile farther into the reservation past that. They have a septic company. Check this out. They got a septic company right along the river that literally pipes septic into a field, grades it out, and they're growing corn in it. They're growing corn. We just went through it today. They're growing corn in it, and it leaches into the river. The field is attached to the river. And the water goes down to the dam on the other side of our reservation. Do your people have any legal leg to stand on to fight that, to get that corrected? See, the thing with Connecticut is we call DEP, they come over and they hold a bland eye. That's why we need more of a voice, you know, uh, nationally, internationally. Hmm. You know, Connecticut's running, right now Connecticut is running a serious anti-Native campaign. And I'm not bashing anybody and I'm not threatening anyone. What I'm saying is that legally we have a whole lot we can do if they don't have lawyers that they can buy out. You know, so being in the UN and being being able to speak to to uh on an international level, I think is is pretty much the only way we're gonna get somewhere with this. The one thing that I really like about the UN is that all all indigenous people <clears throat> from around the world came together. And that was for me personally that was just awesome to sit and share and to and to find out that we all have the same history as far as treaties and, and what happened to our people and the land grabbing and all of that. We've all experienced the same thing no matter what part of the world we're in. And that we can come together in a in a platform like this as indigenous people to where we can together work these things out and get that voice that you're talking about. That that's important. And a lot of and I've heard a lot of uh, native people say, "Well, what good can you do through the UN?" 
that that is a white man's government, how does that benefit us? And the first thing I bring up is the Indigenous People's Bill of Rights. That is honored in, in a lot of places. We never had that before. We have a chance to learn how they work their government, and we're smart people. Native people are smart. We got it on the ball. We, we learn from them, watch them, learn them, and we use their laws and the education we got from them on how these laws work against them for our people. And, and that's the key, Marshu, is, mm-hmm. and that's what I saw also helped storm at the UN, United Nations, was we can share all this information about what's happening in our communities, but we can also, through talking, look for solutions that will work for us. Yes. And, you know, although we can lobby at that international level, um, we still need to find a way to filter it down so that we take it back home and make it real, implement something that will help at a local level or at a community level. Um, otherwise, we could be arguing, you know, forever <laughs> and, and get nowhere. So I, I think the UN gives us that opportunity to share share ideas and share solutions. Mm. I, I completely agree. You know, and and um, before, like, for instance, you know, before I went to the UN and talked to you guys from New Zealand who seem to have their, their stuff going on over there, um, I would never have known that you guys have, uh, you know, one of the three languages that's, that's recognized as Maori, and you guys are actually working on a tremendous um, uh, land deal over there, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and we we know we've learned I think over the years how to utilise our people that work in government agencies because at the end of the day they're Māori first and then they work for the government but but we've learned to work in a way where it's going to benefit government policy but it's going to benefit our people in a real way yeah and that's about getting our land back that's that's it get our land back first, and then we'll sit at a table and negotiate with the farmers or with people that want to lease or, or the second and third generation leasing on our tribal land. But we just need them to recognise first, you know, we're the, we're the landlords, we're not the tenants, and, and then take it, pick it up from there. But the other thing that they know about us over here is we tend to get a bit ugly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing over here, the third thing that we have to get the people that are non-native to realize is that we are still here, and that we and and we we want that that same respect as human beings that a lot of our people don't get, you know. Because I I was in an argument just just the day before yesterday on Facebook with a guy who swears there was no such thing as massacres. And stuff, and he probably didn't believe the Holocaust of the Jewish people either. Like he, you know, to him, they they just didn't exist. And I was trying to explain to him that in many ways, what happened back two and three hundred years ago is still happening today, but in different forms. You know, you got your paper genocide, you've got your scientific genocide, you've got the government doing nuclear testing on around reservations, which are causing a lot of cancer-related illnesses. And I said, these are still the things that our people are dealing with, you know, from when the first migrants came almost 600 years ago. Our people are not being recognized nor respected for all that we have done, you know, and that this is our land. And uh, he's going off of that manifest destiny thing where, you know, it, it was a right for us to come over. And the the strong the stronger always wins, and the weak people are the ones who lose. Is basically what he's saying. And of course, I'm sitting there trying to say, um, your manifest destiny was the wrong ideal to walk into any country. And I'm not saying it just because you did it to us. And I said, you cannot compare the thinking of two different cultures. Your cultures were thinking. Here's an opportunity to get riches and land and to do whatever. And our way of thinking as indigenous people was, oh, these visitors have come from far away, 
And it's our way that the further your people come from, the more we go out of our way to make you feel at home. So you have two completely different mindsets of thinking. Hmm. And uh, and this this individual just wasn't listening. He had already had his mind made up. And after two or three rounds with him, I said, well, this is going nowhere. I'm just going to let it go. You know, and um, I mean, I was very courteous to him. I was just putting fact out there, and he 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 got into the thing about how the government has helped our people, and I said, "You'll never convince me of that." And then he went in on how the Christian missionaries helped the people, and so I had to remind him of the boarding schools and the residential schools, and how the worst thing that ever happened to our people was Christianity first, and then the U.S. government. And I said, in spite of all of that, our people are still here, and we are still fighting to maintain our cultures and our traditions and, above all, our languages. But they, they keep saying, Mike, um, Mike. <laughs> my, my name has changed, and I had no ceremony for it. <laughs> I'm hurt. <laughs> Get over it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we need to make sure that our people have access to some decolonization programs. Because once we walk our people through um, the anger, the hurt, and you know, all the sadness, all the, everything that happened to us historically, and bring them through the other side, it's only then that we can see some real um, a way forward or some solutions. Because we, we have to walk through that stuff, Master, and that's same with that guy you were talking to. Right. He needs to walk through the decolonization so that he has a better understanding for himself because I think it starts with an individual in your mind. You know, get it clear for yourself where we were, what happened to us, and where we are now. You realize that this guy I was talking to wasn't indigenous. He was, he was Yonega. He was Pakiha. Oh, I mean, you entertained that. <coughs> <laughs> That's your own fault. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, you know, here's the thing, and this is what's got me in an uproar, and I know a lot of people haven't haven't had a chance to see this. Um, so I think I'm going to read it to you guys. Uh, I, I know you guys you guys had a chance to uh, to see it, but the, um, this is a letter that was sent to uh, President Barack Obama. Um, in February 24th of this year. All right. This was sent to uh, the president by our uh, Connecticut's governor, Daniel, Daniel Malloy. Um, and, and let's, I'd like to hear you guys opinion after I read it, but I'm going to read it uh, quickly. All right. So here it goes. Dear Mr. President, I write to bring you, bring to your attention an issue of great concern to the, State of Connecticut and to ask for your help. Last June, the Department of the Interior's Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs issued a decision draft <clears throat> proposing revisions of the Bureau, Bureau of Indian Affairs process for federal acknowledgement of Indian tribes. Now, remember, I, I said, you know, honestly, the federal recognition is, is a farce, but this is still um, very much in a um, a very racist and very anti-Native American uh, statement. So I'm going to keep going. Process for federal acknowledgement of Indian tribes. The draft, as proposed, would have a unique and devastating impact in Connecticut. Under the dis discussion draft's expedited favor favorable finding process, the existence of a state reservation since 1934 would be irrebutable evidence that a group satisfies the core criteria for federal acknowledgement, such as continuous existence as a social community and the continuous existence of political influence since 1789. The discussion draft would allow groups that have previously been denied federal tribal status the ability to reapply 
and to seek an expedited favorable finding. The problem with this proposal is simple. Connecticut has maintained reservations since 1934 for, for three groups, they're saying, and I'll correct that in a second, for three groups that have already been denied federal acknowledgement acknowledgement precisely because they did not satisfy the core acknowledgement criteria. In other words, after thorough evidentiary processes involving thousands of pages of evidence, extensive expert testimony, and intensive participation of petitioners, the state and other interested parties, the Department of the Interior concluded that the existence of the state reservation in Connecticut could not be taken as proxy for the core acknowledgement criteria. The department's decision to deny federal acknowledgement in all three petitioners have been upheld, upheld by the courts. So um, what they're saying is that three tribes uh, applied for federal recognition and were denied. But the fact remains, and, and like I said, I'm not for federal recognition, but the fact remains that Scattercook did go for federal recognition in 2004 and was granted federal recognition in 2004, and then they overturned the federal recognition in 2005 because of fraudulent paperwork having nothing to do with who the Scattercook people were. And I will take that up with Malloy at any time if he wants to go down that road. Just putting it there. So let me continue. Connecticut maintains reservations simply because there are living descendants of the groups of which the reservations were first established. Now, of course, there were, were living descendants of the groups when they first were established, but they are saying that they've maintained these reservations simply because of that. They have no right to say that. Reservations are held in trust. Reservations are protected because that's their job. That's what they have to do because they put us there. All right, not because they simply wanted to be nice guys and say they're going to take care of it because we are the living descendants like we're a museum piece. You know, uh, Hawk, uh, mm -hmm. reservations are nothing more than concentration camps originally, and so a nice guy wouldn't put your people there in the first place. Exactly. <laughs> I just wanted to point that out to you. That's the yeah. truth. That's the truth. You know, but, but the reason that they're scared and the reason that he's writing the president is not because he's worried about us getting federal recognition or, or worried uh, or because he doesn't honestly care about Native Americans. What he's worried about right now is the fact that they took they did one thing that 90% that of the population of the United States did not do is they, is they took a treaty tribe's land without any recourse, without any courts, without any anything, and sold it. They built houses on the reservation and forced people out. According to, uh, according to the overseers, when, when a tribe has overseers, right, and houses are in disrepair, part of, part of the thing that was supposed to happen is the houses would be repaired. If somebody died, the next part of that family could move into that house. So what happened at Scattercook in the 30s is that when somebody died, they burned the house down and forced us out like militia. And this happened for, from what I can tell, it happened for about 30 years until they got pretty much everybody off the reservation and then claimed that we didn't have continual, um, continual community and occupation of the, of the land. So then they forced, they, they, continued to have Kent School and other other uh, private uh, groups take over the land and, and just make it smaller and smaller. But anyway, that, that, that's what they're afraid of is because they know that they took this land very much illegally. They didn't, they didn't even like pretend to go to court and, and, uh, and, and acquisition the land the way others have. They, they literally just took it. Mm. You know, so now they're saying that this, this, uh, what happens with this is only directly going to affect Connecticut because Connecticut honestly was stupid enough to do it that way. You know, so yeah, you, you're about to get spanked by the federal government. Okay, I have a question, and it's and it's not meant to sound like being sarcastic or anything, but 
uh, where was your tribal leadership at that time? Did they did they try to stop this treatment and the burning of the homes? Was there any type of legal recourse whatsoever? They got basically, um, it, it, from what I can tell from back then, all right, so the last thing that I saw, um, and and uh, what they'll tell you is all the information burned, but through, through the research that I've been able to come up with, um, I believe at that time in the 30s there was a militia in uh, in Kent, but I can't I can't honestly say and prove it. Um, but I can tell you that in Dover Plains and New Milford, all of a sudden there was a very big movement of Scattercook Indians moving into those two towns: Absolutely. Dutchess County, Litchfield, New Milford. All of a sudden. Those towns got inundated with with uh, Scattercook Indians moving into those towns and off the reservation. And this is in uh, in the 30s and 40s. Did your did your people keep any records of what was going on that would go, you know, as opposed to the to the non-native people keeping their records of their courts, which they apparently didn't do very well. But did, um, something pretty bad happened at that point. I can't really go into it, um, you know, without sounding accusatory. Mm -hmm. No, and I, and I don't want you to point fingers or anything. I was just wondering if there was any records or anything kept, you know, that your people might be able to use against all that to help you in your fight today because, um, especially with the help of, a, of a, an attorney that specializes in Indian law, I think um, one of the main things that has to be done is that the um, we need a lawyer that can subpoena land records without being bought out. You know, the, the through the years the government has paid less. I think there's been millions of dollars worth of money going around on this. That the the uh, I mean Connecticut has definitely put down a lot of money trying to stop anybody from finding the real information on getting our our, our uh, land situations done taken care of they're they're willing to put down another 300,000 right now to fight anybody that comes against them right now hmm. so the problem is so finding a lawyer that doesn't work for the state or doesn't get you know well from what I've heard in the last few years, a lot of tribes are, have been thinking seriously of dropping their federal recognition um, no, because, because they've, they've found, or they, I shouldn't say they found, they've realized that a lot of the projects and the monies that they get you know, for the projects that they want to do for their tribal communities, they can get it much quicker and faster without all the red tape and bureaucracies by applying for grants like what you know anybody else can apply for and there's not the weight you know that goes with it i think the one thing that they're probably thinking about is like the elders and especially the young because uh they they get um what's that the ir check indian relief we call it you know for the elders you know that's aside from their um from their medicare and their social security if they if they were the ones that had worked and then uh I think the young ones is what they're worried about as well. So I don't know how that's, how that's working out. Um, but the government is the one who brought this blood quantum thing, which was the thing that started to divide our people, one of the many things that started to divide our people and give them the fact that they could take our land. The sad thing about that is that our people bought into it, where today you have, even amongst our own people, you hear it stupid nonsense like I'm more Indian than you are and all this kind of stuff. Our people never had that. Our people never had that. And uh, I know Dor Doreen said they tried that over in New Zealand at one time where they tried to put it on your income tax filing, I think it was. And, uh, um, the test. Oh, uh, yeah, on the census. And wanted people to to list their what would be equivalent to blood quantum, and the Maori people just refused it. They they ignored it. Nobody filled it out, so it didn't work there. 
And this is one of the things that goes along with what Doreen said earlier about uh, about our people need need to go through decolonization programs of some sort because this is where we would get our people to start thinking indigenous again and mm. doing mm. things more native. And I think uh, as far as culture, tradition, and language, but also who who they are as indigenous people. And I think that out of that, and knowing what we know today, I think our people will, will really, really benefit from that. And that's one of the things that Doreen and I have gone into um, is doing the decolonization programs for any tribal group. You know, it can be tailored for any tribal group around the world. And I'm sure that there's other indigenous groups out there that are doing along the same lines that we are, but differently. Mm. And I think... But the whole film, that, that's what I can hear. I can hear where you're at. I think you've taken yourself through that education of what happened to us, what we used to be like before the white man or Pākehā came. Yeah, you know, and then you took yourself through everything that happened to your people, and, and you've actually brought yourself out the other end. And I think going to the UN seems like one of the solutions because you're looking for ways to help to do a bit more. It seems to be that you've already took, taken yourself through that decolonisation. Yeah, you probably went the long way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you went there. <laughs> Well, you, well, you have to, you have to, if, if we're going to go any, if we're going to go forward, you know. Yeah. But, but seriously, we have to know the past. We can't forget the past, and what happened to our people. That's important for us to never forget, and use that today. And which is, you know, a lot of people are in that, in that uh, part of the process right now, so that you can prepare and make a better future. And your hope is that while you're doing it, you do it in a way where all peoples, even the non-indigenous people, are going to be able to live with that, and where we can live in peace, you know. And we, can't, we can't approach it in anger anymore, you know. And, right. and nothing against you, Maori, but we can't approach it in anger anymore, you know. Oh. And <laughs> we have to. Um, we have, we're very smart people. We wouldn't have survived this long if we weren't. You know, we're talking about 500 years of of, of really bad. Tough. <laughs> um, you know, right. how do you survive something like that? How do how do how is there even a tribe still existent on the east coast of America? How is that possible? Well, obviously we had to use our brains. So why can't we use our brains now? You know, the the best thing that we can do is communicate at this point. And and you know these these uh, I, I I agree and I understand. These protests, I, I, I have nothing really against. I don't know more. Um, I think everything has a place. But I also think that there's people uh, that are willing to, to, um, to speak to the, to the people we need to speak to and, and, and um, show that, you know, we're not only still here, but we're very intelligent. And really, if it wasn't for us, America wouldn't be what it is right now. You know, I, I mean, not that it's in the greatest shape, but, but, you know, we've been in every part of creating what where we are, and I think that we we don't get the credit that we deserve, as uh, and not even close to get the credit that we deserve, and in uh, our part in first of all making sure that everybody here didn't speak French, right now, and and another thing is the fact that that you know. We've died in every single war for this country, and we don't we don't even get equal rights. You know, as, according to uh, according to the U.S. government, um, we didn't get our rights to to burn smudge until 1978. So I mean, we couldn't even practice religion. You know, we still don't have certain certain uh, human rights. Like, you know, there is still a law out there. All right, that's still in effect. That gives from from uh, the the English from from my tribe alone fifteen pounds for an adult male scalp mm -hmm. and uh, 
10 pounds for a woman or child. Oh, guys, you guys got gypped because with us it was uh, 25 for a man's scalp, 15 for a woman's, and 10 for a child. Oh. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's that's stuff, that's those laws are still in effect. Those those laws are still in effect. Yeah. Blue laws. You know, the slavery. I mean, we we were never we were never a part of. You know that Freedom Act. You know our religious freedom didn't come until 1978. You know, and and still today, you know, you know, like you were saying, then you know we could we could actually do this a different way and. Say we are we are a religious Native American religious group, and and go buy a bunch of land and make it tax free and do it that way. Everybody else seems to do that, right? But now we have the we have the right to do that, mm. right? I, I mean, mm. I don't know. I know in Alabama uh, up until 1967, if you were known to be Native, you lost your home, your property, and your livestock, and up until 1985. If more than two indigenous people were seen talking in public on the street, you ran the risk of being arrested. Yes. So, uh, so a lot of our people down south don't even admit they're Indian. You know, they're, are they just coming out of that now? You know. So yeah. there's there's still a lot of uh, crazy laws that are still out there, and fortunately, I guess for most, that those laws aren't enforced. Um, I think it depends on where you are. I think if you find really heavily populated indigenous areas, you're going to find them where they're in, you know, enforced more. Uh, more. I've actually seen signs on businesses, especially like further west, where it says, um, uh, no shoes, no shirts, no dogs, and no Indians. And we're always at the bottom of the list. It's horrible. As you mouse here, I think it's time for a break. I think it is, too. So why don't we close and we'll come back in approximately five minutes. Excellent. Join us on Just Us Radio Network for our shows, Inflowment, Unity in Community, Numbers in Time, The Indigenous People's Voice, One Point of View, Walking the Talk with Kurt, and the People's Round Table. Check out our website for information about upcoming shows. Just ask Google to find Just Us Radio Network and you will find links to our website and to our blog talk and Facebook pages as well as to our podcast where you can subscribe for automatic downloads. Welcome back. Um, Doreen, can you tell us um, what the song was during break and who the artist was? All right. Hold on. I, I sort of nipped out for a little bit, but <laughs> it was Fiddy Michael Black, and, and uh, way it, uh, the song is, is it Kei He Takuruo? And it's about restoring our language. It's, Fiddy Michael is known here in um, Aotearoa as being one of the leaders, I guess, for our Māori language, and she does it through song. Very good. Kao pai. Um, welcome back, everybody. Uh, for people who might want to call in and have questions for Sachem Robert Hawkstorm, our call-in number is area code 718-506-1564. Again, that's 718 area code 506 one five six four, and you may also uh, contact us through our website, Just Us Radio Network, and uh, there's also a comment section there on the website. So feel free to contact us uh, that way as well if you'd like. Um, very interesting show so far. Um, I think a lot of people don't don't realize what uh 
what it is to be indigenous living in today's world because we have two different worlds that we live in. And, and uh, it's, it's, especially for our young people, it's, it can be a challenge. And I think it's up to us adults to set the example on how we can survive in a world that's not indigenous and still maintain our um, our individual uh, indigenous culture at the same time. And it can be done. It's been done for a long time by many people. And uh, there's a lot of apprehension and fear, I think, on the population of the non-indigenous because they have not been around it. A lot of times, um, I know here, I've I've been in Chicago and they'll see they saw me and my late wife walking around and we still dress traditional, and they thought all of us they thought we were all dead, they thought that there was a few Indians living on oil wells out in Oklahoma and there, there was some out in Arizona making jewelry, but um, I mean and that's that's literally the the truth of it they actually didn't think there was any of our people left and uh, I think that has a lot to do with the uh, education in this country. Um, I know. <laughs> nice way to put it. I, 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 my hair was braided at the time, and I had an eagle feather in my hair and a beaded vest, and people would ask me, what country are you from? Wow. Now, what does that Can t- you say to that, Matthew? Huh? <laughs> what can you say to that, though? They say, how do you, how do you like my city? I said, it's wonderful. How do you like my country? <laughs> they go, huh? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it takes it takes people that are committed, that are educated, not only in our, uh, our indigenous ways, but also in our non-indigenous ways in today's world, the 21st century. To, to bring our people through this in a positive way. And uh, this, is, this is the time, according to prophecy, and the prophecy uh, is that we are the generation to do this. You know, and whatever we do is going to be for the children in the future. And this is where I feel you're going to see a lot of our leaders starting to come. Because our people have not had leaders for a long time. You know, with uh, that that had the uh, the pull of such men, you know, like like you know, of our heroes and our leaders of the past, like Chief Joseph Tecumseh, uh, Dragon Canoe, uh, all of these people, you know. And I think this is the time that we're going to see these leaders, not these leaders, but leaders like those in our histories come through. You know, to to bring our people, and I and I still feel that's uh, that's still a part of prophecy. And we as indigenous people, no matter where you put us, no matter which community we're living in, we have these prophecies, we have these stories. You know, that's a part of us. It's in our DNA. You know, and that and 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 that can't change. Um, where where do your people stand right now, Hawk? <clears throat> On this, I know this is a is a relatively uh, new, uh, let's say, challenge for your people. Where 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 does it stand right now? As far as um, well, you know, people are like you said, people are very uneducated. Um, even in our own people, we're very uneducated um, on on what can be done and uh, what avenues to go to be able to exercise our rights. I mean, you know, federal recognition has really put a damper on on, um, on people as well because, I mean, you could talk to people on the streets or you could talk to tribal members and they, they, you know, people think that because you're a member of a tribe, you're automatically getting a check um, you're, you've got the best health care in the world. You, you, uh, you know, <laughs> you always have a place to live. Um, you know, these are all, they're all false. You know, the, the federal government has really painted a very pretty picture of what 
a native is. And, you know, a lo- the, the vast majority of people don't understand that just because you're native, you don't get the best education in the world. You, you know, just because you're native, you don't, you, you, you're not automatically going to get the best insurance. I mean, that's not going to happen. You know, in actuality, it's, it's just the opposite. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, and, you know, with, with, um, to be able to even educate our own people on this is very difficult. It's very difficult. You know, I've tried, I've been trying to teach people, um, and, and reiterate the laws on, on Native Americans, reiterate what they need to really do as far as, um, petitioning and, and not, not so much petitioning, but, but speaking with, uh, government officials. Um, putting our voices in the right venues, um, going going to the UN is a huge thing, I, I believe, because we're talking about indigenous peoples as equals across the board. We're not just talking about individual tribes. And I think the biggest problem with the with the U.S. Um, as you know, uh, North America pulled out of the World Conference. Um, I believe that's a, that was a huge, huge, huge detrimental thing to happen. Because uh, one of the things that the main reason that the uh, let me explain this. The main reason that North America pulled out of the World Conference was because of their lack of equal rights. Now, we haven't had equal rights since the beginning. We're talking about 500 years of occupation here. We haven't had equal rights. We haven't had a, a voice in the U.N. until 2007. So. I think we're taking a lot of baby steps, and it's a lot of fighting to get here. I mean, it's taken it's taken a hell of a lot for our people to even get a voice, let alone an equal voice. So I I, I think to to step away just because you think that you should have an equal voice right away, they're going to move forward with or without you. You know, so uh, for us to 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 make a statement or a move like that, and you're, and you're talking about um, a bunch of tribes that are not even representing every single individual tribe that's supposedly here. I don't believe in, in the massive amounts of tribes that they're saying. This is a federal ploy. This is what's happened with federal recognition and, and divide and conquer, like we were talking about earlier. But um, but you're you're speaking for every indigenous person in North America saying that you don't believe that we should be in the world conference on indigenous people because we don't have an equal voice. Well, how are we ever going to have an equal voice if that happens? How is that ever going to happen if you're, if you're not willing to take the steps to get there? I mean, yes, I have all the respect for you in the world. You got us this far. You, you worked this hard to get this far. I get it. You're working with the, with the other indigenous peoples of the world. It's taken all this time to get to get the two representatives that we have that are that are that we're trying to get in in the world conference and get this get these uh, laws on indigenous peoples passed and and it's wonderful. But if you're going to back out now and not even give us a chance to have a have an equal voice in the future, we're never going to get it. You know, and like I said, they're going to move forward with or without us. Mm. That's right. So I, I, I'd like to um, just take this time, um, Marsha and Hawksbourne, because I have a colleague and one of our board members from Two Feathers, as well as a board member for the Indian Treaty Council, Carl Hutchby, with me. So I'd just like to introduce Carl into the conversation, if you don't mind. Um, and because Carl uh, is... Okay. <laughs> no, that's I guess so. Uh, <laughs> he is going to the World Conference and he has been you know, keeping himself up to date with what's been happening for our Indigenous people. Mm. So Carl, if you'd like to okay. make a comment. Okay, thank you, Doreen. Um, Osio... Mashu, it's always fantastic um, listening to you on the radio, and yeah, uh, I've I've been listening very intently to your conversation, and as usual, you've got some very very wise words. So thank you, and also to you, Hawkstorm. It's been um, 
you know, sitting here, I've gone through lots of emotions, I suppose, listening to your your stories and all of that. But um, just picking up on a couple of things, you know, that both Mushu and Doreen have talked about, and that's the um, decolonisation process. I think that's so important that we really grab hold of that and, and utilise that, um, those tools that not only Two Feathers is working on very, um, very hard, both uh, he, mostly here in Aotearoa, um, and we're utilising the skills of mushroom as well, but we've seen the difference that that makes when we put, particularly our men that are in jail, and who have uh, gone through some horrendous things and butted heads against the systems, how that changes their lives, and how they come out of that the other end uh, being part of a community and understanding um, what that means for them, what it means to stand tall and be Māori in this world and that you can walk in the both worlds. Um, the other thing, you know, around the United Nations, that's an amazing thing and it was great to meet you over there, Hawkstorm. In terms of that, I agree, it is very sad that our North American um, Indigenous brothers and sisters have walked away um, from that. But, you know, again, that, that's part of the process and I think what we've got to... Um, look at in, in all of this stuff is that we need to do a lot of healing within ourselves in the first instance and and we need to do that with ourselves, by ourselves and outside of those forums um, and then move on. But you're right, Hawkstorm, it will go ahead without them. There will be um, heavy hearts that they're not there um, and it is sad that they're not there. But However, we still need to move on and we need to do what we need to do for, for all. And we will still include them in, in our discussion. Yeah, in, in our... Um, You're there whether you like it or not. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, with, you know, they, they've got some healing to do and good on them. But we will make sure that their voice is heard. Um, and that, that they are part of us because they are our Indigenous brothers and sisters and we just need to do it. We need to get on with it. Um, just another thing, you know, you were talking about, you mentioned um, you've got to try and find a lawyer that will support you in your quest. Then, you know, maybe that's the UN, maybe, because there are lots of lawyers at the UN, as you know, and maybe you need to kind of get a, a lawyer that isn't, part of the United States system and cannot be bought off because there's many lawyers so maybe that's an avenue you could look at um, and you know that you know um, Mashu, Doreen and, and just about every other Indigenous brother and sister is 100% behind what you're doing. Um, you know the other thing I want to recognise too, sorry and I talk a lot, sorry Mashu and Doreen, is it is fantastic <laughs> Um, Hawkstorm that you, and that is so cultural, you have your um, clan mother sitting next to you um, and a whole a number of other people sitting around you and that is us as Indigenous people, we never walk alone when we're doing these things, so that was awesome before we came on you and introduced us, so that, you know fantastic to know that you've got that support around you mm. and it is good cultural support that we need when we walk in these journeys yeah, so yeah, I'm going to be over at, in New York um, at the um, World Conference, and I know Mushu and Doreen are going to be there. They don't believe me, they'll be there, um, a, along with you, Hawkstorm, um, and yeah. we'll just keep continuing to move the battle forward. Well, not really the battle, but, you know, move our issues forward. I think, for me personally, what needs to happen, because they put the zero draft out, is that those words need to be a bit stronger because a lot of the stuff we've already decided on. So it's about, we need to use words like um, affirm um, and make this happen. You, you know, those sorts of words rather than take the... And I've been very um, vocal around that here in the Pacific, saying that um, we need to strengthen those words and we also need to strengthen the, um, the youth caucus. There's not a lot... In the, not the youth caucus itself, but there's not a lot of um, uh, dialogue around youth in there. Um, so I've put my voice here into the Pacific around strengthening 
the words in the document, the zero draft, and also um, ensuring that the youth voice is heard a lot louder than what it is in that draft. But other than that, you know, it's, it's, it's there. We've, we've got this far. We've just got to continue with it. Hmm. Have we really discussed what the zero draft is about? Um, the zero draft is, well, maybe you might be better to answer that one, Hawk Storm, or I can if you want, but what, do you want to answer that? Um, well, you know, the zero draft is almost, <laughs> it's, it's almost the full draft. We only have one day really to, mm. uh, to, um, you know, exercise our opinions or thoughts or, um, what we believe should be in there. We really only have one more day to, uh, to do that. So, I mean, the zero draft, yeah, it's supposed to be a rough draft. There, it's, uh, you know, written by the, the heads, heads of state um, off of what we've already come up with. But mm. like you said, I think that it's, it is a little weak in, in, um, in, in, in certain aspects, especially I found that it does dance around the fact that we are um, – Sovereign self-governing entities. I did notice that it danced around that quite a bit. Um, mm. You know, basically that that we um, we need their help way more than than um, than we do. I think we need more of their support mm -hmm. than 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 help. I think that uh, we're very capable of of running our governments. You know, we've been. We have been uh, messed with for a very long time, so yeah, it's going to take a, a, a little while to get in the back in the groove of being able to uh, be ourselves. But and and it's been uh, it's been very much done that way on purpose. Um, mm. But I think that it does kind of dance around that uh, a little more than I'd like. I think that it should be more uh, confirmed that that it's recognized that we are. Um, sovereign, self-governing entities. So this is what the zero graph, uh, draft is, and I'm I'm asking for an explanation of what this is for our listeners who may not have a clue of what you're talking about. Oh. Okay, so the zero draft has come out of the preparatory meetings. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so um, I just need to <clears throat> kind of go back. So in Alta last year. Um, the Sami Parliament brought a whole lot of Indigenous people over to Alta to draft a document that was a preparatory document to launch the uh, World Indigenous Conference off. Um, it was agreed um, just after the last um, permanent forum uh, when there was an, uh, an outcry to the uh, uh, President of the General Assembly to make a decision on the um, World Conference. There was an outcry from Indigenous people and states for him to make up his mind. He then called a special meeting after the uh, uh, the permanent forum finished. So those of us that were still there, which included myself um, from the Pacific and a couple of other people and the, some of the states were still there. Um, we agreed then on the appointment of two people, Indigenous people, to sit alongside the um, President of the General Assembly, which was um, Liz Melzer from Australia oh, yeah. and Myrna, Dr. Myrna Cunningham from um, Brazil. I'm not sure of which country, sorry, you have to excuse me on that one. So they were appointed and expected to sit alongside the um, the President of the General Assembly and um, be his advisors, I suppose. So, and it was also agreed there that the um, altered outcome document would be the basis to any documents that would come out of, uh, um, that would launch us into the um, World Conference. Um, so they've had meetings, which you were at when she hooked storm um, a couple of weeks ago, and the zero draft 
came out of those meetings with the um, state, the president of the General Assembly, and um, interventions from Indigenous people. So that's where the zero draft came from. So it launched off the um, ALTA document with, a, with a, a week or so worth of meetings and discussions, and then from that the zero draft came, which will be the the document that goes into the World Indigenous Conference to confirm where we're at moving forward. So, so was, was that was that about right? The World Conference is the World Conference for Indigenous People. Yes. Yes. So uh, originally, they the states were going to have it on their own without any Indigenous representative. That's right. So. Um. Yes and no. So the majority of the states were saying we can't have an Indigenous conference without Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. There were three states, one African, uh, Russia, and uh, one of the Asian states, who what they did was ask for clarification on what the, what the uh, World Conference will be. The PGA decided, in his wisdom, that they were actually opposing it. They made it very clear they were not opposing the World Conference. They were seeking clarification around some of the processes. Um, does that answer that question? So, just, yeah. just so that, well, it makes sense in anyone's world mm. <laughs> that Indigenous people should be at the World Conference. Absolutely. If it's about Indigenous people. Absolutely, and that's what we were Otherwise, saying. again, it's the state deciding mm. what's best for mm. us. Yeah. So, so I, you know, congratulations to you, Hawkstorm, and to Gonzalia and the others mm. that have been part of the prep meeting mm. to get us to where we are now. At least we'll be there, we'll be heard in some way. Mm. Whether or not anything will come of it is another story, but but at least we're at the table, and that's what needed to happen was, you know, mm. get us at the table, and then we'll make a noise once we're there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. Absolutely right, Doreen. We do need to be at that table and we do need to have a voice and that's what a lot of... Um, so we were all there at the, the last day of the um, permanent forum when the uh, representative for the PGA got up and spoke and gave us some fluffy things and kind of basically said we're not too sure what's going to happen. So the amazing thing that I thought happened then was um, all of the Indigenous people and the, the, the different caucuses got up and slammed the PG for his um, indecision. And not only the Indigenous people, but the state. All of the states that were there got up and slammed the PG for not being more assertive in his decision-making. So hence the meeting happened afterwards, um, which I had the fortunate... I was fortunate enough to still be there and was able to attend. But it was... It was crazy that, that it had to go that way, but we're there at the table, and you're quite right. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm, it, it's really, it was really good that it did go that way because then we did see that the, you know, the states were actually taking it very seriously. Mm, absolutely. You know, you know so I, it, it was good. I felt that it was good that it went that way because before that, you know, we've been listening to the states say all kinds of stuff for a long time. That was the first time I really felt the affirmation that they actually gave a crap about what we were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're probably right, Hawkstorm. That 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 really did confirm where the state sat around Indigenous peoples. That it, you know there is no way that they were going to have a conference without Indigenous people there. It would have been a non yeah. non conference. It's just yeah. nonsense yeah. that they would even entertain that idea. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. When we were at the uh, permanent forum, Marsha, yeah, Marsha and I had the opportunity to meet with the state representative for USA. Now she is very supportive mm. of getting um, some indigenous initiatives up and running. Um, so it's just a matter of us following up with that. But but it seems like. A lot of the states are in support of, of indigenous initiatives and indigenous rights. It's just we have to be clever how mm. how we design a program or a proposal for them that aligns to their policies. Mm. 
because uh, they're not going to deviate from the, you know, what their policies say. But I, I think you're right, um, Hawkstorm, we are clever enough to be able to write and design something that appeases them and gets us what we want. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It really, really, that's what it is. It's a game. I mean, we're playing chess right now. Um, and if you're gonna, if you're gonna bow out as soon as you lose a couple of pawns, I mean, that's part of the game. You know, uh, know. that that was my issue. Is that you know, we we finally have our foot in the door. And and granted, the door is just barely cracked open. Okay. You know, getting these two seats up there is a huge, huge, huge move for us. You know, and we're not going to have an equal say right away. We're definitely not going to have an equal say right away. we got to get that out of our heads. The fact that remains that we are there. We are in there. Yeah. They actually, We actually have their ears right now. And we now we have to start learning the process because we're still babies at this. We have to really yeah. learn this process, learn their English or their, their language. You know, yeah. get, our own, get our own Black's Laws Dictionary going. So that we understand when w- exactly what their terminology is, and we can use it with uh, for our own benefit, like you said. Absolutely. Yeah. That's Absolutely. Right. That that is key. Absolute key. That's quite a neat challenge, really, when you it look is. at it. Yeah, it is. A, it is. A, <laughs> it's a neat challenge for yeah. us, any yeah. one of us, yeah. to pick that yeah. up. And and you're right. Um, both Mushu and Hawkstorm and Dore, we would we would not be here if we weren't smart people. You know, we've learnt um, to work these systems from time to time. We've learnt to duck and dive when we've needed to, but we need to congratulate ourselves in the sense that even, like, we're we're babies in terms of colonisation here in Aotearoa. We've been, I think it's just coming up to 200 years. Mm. You guys have had them for 600 years, you know, but, Mm. but you're still there, and you're still a force to be reckoned with, and you're going to be there in the next 600 years, the next 1,000 years. You know, we will never, ever go away. And these non-Indigenous people and governments need to understand that that is how it is. Um, and we have to be, and we are clever, if we survive what we survive. And, yes, OK, our cultures have taken a huge knock. We've lost a lot of our lands. We've lost a lot of things. But we are still here, and we are still holding on, and we will continue to do so. And they need to understand that, you know. That, that's it. Until they get that, um, and until they're prepared to come and talk at the table, because we always make compromise, you know, we're, which is part and parcel of what you need to do. Mm-hmm. We, we, we have to do the compromise over here around our, our treaties and that. And, you know, we get that over here. Oh, you're getting all of this land and all of this money. Well, if you looked at it in terms of today's money, we're probably getting ten cents an acre. You right. know? And right. what we you know, okay, so the, the what they do out there is they publicise this here we got twenty million dollars, you know? Well naturally people are gonna go twenty million dollars, you know, it's a lot of money here in Aotearoa. But if you break that down to the costing of the land, to the costing of each person uh, all of those things, it doesn't come out to a lot. And we are having to, as iwi around, around the country, are having to build an economic base on that small amount of money. And that's not a lot of money we've been given, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm. But we're doing it. We're saying, OK, you're going to give us that, we'll take it. Um, around the 99-year leases that Doreen and you were talking about, we had that over here as well. And yes, the same thing happened. When the leases came up and when the land, uh, the treaty claims started happening, we had that, oh, the Maoris are going to come in and take all of our houses and all of that. <laughs> you know, it's like, hello, we don't want your stupid houses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're not going to bring their houses down. <laughs> it's like, we, you know, you've, you've lived there. We recognise that you've lived there for generations. But all we're saying is now you're going to start paying us the rent. You're not paying the government or, or the pure, I think with the 99 year leases was something like one cent an acre. Yeah. So we used to get land checks back in the day. Mum would go, oh, I've got my land check, you know, for a thousand acres in prime land. And it was about 
you know, mm-hmm. and it's like when the 99 year leases came up, well, that quadrupled in, in money. So, you know, we had a lot of them going, oh, you're charging us exorbitantly. Well, hello, you've had 99 years of paying one cent an acre. Get real. There's no one in this country. Right. <laughs> right. We're charging, we're charging the going rate. Yeah. So get over yourself and pay the money, otherwise get off the land. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the reason that they think that is because that's what was done to us. And so they, it, I think that they're thinking that if the tables are turned, that we're going to do that to them. Yeah. No matter, no matter how much we, we, we uh, assure them that that's not going to happen, that fear is there. Right. Yeah. Well, it's hate mongering. It's hate mongering, is what yeah. it is. It, it, you know, it's not speaking to us. It's not trying to, trying to work things out with us. We're still like a non-existent entity to them. So they're having their own meetings and their own council and and getting everybody fired up and everybody's afraid to really talk to the beast. That the the so-called beast that we are, yeah. and and say, what are you really going to do? You know, yeah. are you really going to take my home? Because I'm looking at the kid and I'm looking at my kid who's playing with this kid on the playground, yeah. thinking, why the hell would I take this person's home? Exactly. Yeah. So it is about that. It is about getting out there and educating them. And you know, we did it. Um, now we don't. We hardly ever hear about that anymore. It used to be big news once upon a time over here. Every time there was a land claim, oh God, the marriage is going to take a house. I know, and you've got to understand also how Pakia white white people how they think. Yes. Because they panic. They're not like us, which as Indigenous people we tend to hold it in or meet with ourselves to discuss. Yeah. But they actually go running to the government and the police. That's what they do, and that's just how they are. So knowing that, it's, it's, yeah, we know how to work with that. We can yeah. strategize as as a people yeah. on their behaviour yeah. and what to expect. So it's just a matter of us being clever how we're going to react to yeah. their reaction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and you're right, Hawkstorm. You know why would you do that? You know you've got these kids that are growing up together and playing together, and why would you take their home? Mm. And a lot of it here was about that, was about getting onto the media. We're a way smaller country, obviously. Mm. But having good, strong, solid people get out there into the media and whatnot and say, no, we're not going to do that, and try and alleviate those fears. Yeah. 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 And, and it was, you know, they're all good now, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I'm well. coming over to visit you. I want to I wanna see how you guys do it. I'm coming <laughs> all if all else fails... We'll put out. We'll put them in a pot. Yeah. We'll <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we don't do that anymore. No, no, we don't do that anymore. I'll tell you, you know, our our tamuk or our tattoo face and you know all of that stuff is is a, an expression of endowment and of achievement for our people. Mm. But it's scary yeah. for a lot of non, you know, for a lot of um, non-indigenous people. Um, and but we will use that. We will use that if we have to, to get what's fair and right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's um, yeah, it is. Doreen's right, you know. And you guys, it is about. You just have to give them time, and you have to, you know, understand that they don't react to things the way we do, and let them go through their panic mode, and then when they're all panicked out and got themselves right, but it's, you guys have got a big battle, I think, yeah. you, you know, because you're a way bigger country, and you've got, you know, like, you've got 600 years of their indoctrination around, you know, um, Indigenous people being this and that and everything else, the, the false stuff. That's right, and they're, they're non-Indigenous people aren't well educated. No, they're totally not, <laughs> but, you know, maybe we need, well, they need some decal too around their women stuff, but yeah. You'll get there. We will. I have absolute faith, and I love I love hearing your when you talk, Masha, around it as the time and and the prophecy and that. And I just so so agree with that. It really is that time. Yeah. 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 I, I, I guess talk from like you've come into our little little group and Sano family. Um. I I end up. I believe everything does happen for a reason. Yeah. The right people are around you at the right time. Yeah. Um, because I, 
like last year, I believe time is now. Yes. Things are starting to happen now for change, and it's positive change for our people. Whether it, it be, you know, the, this great catastrophe is going to happen, it's still going to be a positive change for our people. Yeah. So, and I, I think the time is now, Marcy. It is. Oh, gosh, I totally agree. I totally agree. I was talking to Ghazali about that, too, when I was in the, in the uh, hanging out in the city with him. And, and uh, Ghazali said, you know, uh, there's a reason that that certain people come together. There's a reason that, you know, um, I I came in to, to this group and get to work with such wonderful people like you and Carl and, and uh Roberto um, and uh, and Pam and it's just it's it's because it's time for change and the people that that are willing to do it tend to gravitate to each other and and uh, you know sitting with Kenneth Deer I'm I've had an opportunity to really you know uh, to learn from some of the people that that have been doing this their entire lives that that uh, that really have a passion for um helping and working with indigenous people across the board and and not segregating us into these little factional or fractional groups we mm. are we're we're all dealing with the top 10 problems basically you know um you can come out with hundreds and hundreds of issues that we're dealing with but they're all derived from colonization and um and and the main you know, I say ten. There's there's more than that, but you know, they they're all based from the same ten problems that we all face. Yeah. You know, yeah. and we're and it's and and then if you look at it that way, then there's it it makes us pretty much the same people across the board. You know, yeah. we're we're yeah. You know, so it makes it a lot easier to work with each other that way. I believe. And do you find um? Do you find that the people are are beginning to understand what the importance is of unity amongst our people? I think that it's a lot easier to swallow nowadays. I mean, like you said, there's there's even uh, federal tribes that are looking to get to drop federal recognition because they're realizing that it's it's uh, there's a bigger thing to worry about here. You know, I. And um, you know, just even even watch. I think if you if you watch stuff that happened in the '70s and the and the and the '60s and um, and AIM and even even the way they handle things now is is on a much much more open scale, much more open to uh, talking mm -hmm. to others and working together with others. Rather than jumping into a battle right away, you know, let's rather than picking up the guns, it's time. You know, now they now people are way more apt to uh, sit down and have a conversation. But I think you have to look at it that at that time, that that things had to be done in that way at that time because people were not even ready to even consider listening. Well, yeah, exactly. Now, now is a time of of change, and now is a time of where you know we're realizing. You know, it's funny. The internet, as a matter of fact, has has definitely helped. And I'll tell you, if Tecumseh had a computer, this country would be a whole different world. I'll tell Amen. You, what, you know. Amen. But uh, you know, or even a cell phone. I mean, come on. You know. Right now we're talking to each other in, in two different countries. You know, this is this is important. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. this kind of stuff is very important. And the communication we're in we're in the age of communication. And now that we can see that we're not the only ones here and you can see that you're not the only ones there, even though you're trapped on that tiny little island, you're not the only one there. <laughs> you know, all over all over the world we're seeing we're seeing indigenous people having the same Issues and we can talk about it and we can come together in the United Nations and we can actually walk through the door now and sit inside. Sometimes they even give us a room that we can sit in, and then we can we can discuss these issues and and realize that we're all we're all really on the same page. 
that's the one thing that when the first time that I went into the UN and I saw all these different indigenous people from all over the world, the one thing that hit me is that I wish our people could see how all of these tribes are coming together for this and understand what unity means. This is this is the only place only way we're gonna get anywhere is if we especially amongst our indigenous peoples here on Turtle Island, stop this bickering, this petty bickering and stuff. You know, we've got bigger fish to fry. You know, we have to learn to work together within our tribes, and only at that point are we going to be able to work together with other tribes. I completely agree, and I see the main problem with that is the division of state and federal recognition. I think as long as tribes look at the federal government to recognize who they are instead of recognizing themselves, we are going to continue to have this problem. And that's a part, a big part of the decolonization. Yeah. yeah. Right. That so, is, that is, in a nutshell, what the decolonization has to accomplish. Hmm. Wow. 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 Nicely. Hmm. Well, I'm glad we got that one solved tonight, guys. <laughs> yeah. This is um, I, I just feel like Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> well, Phil, I, I know you've got you've got some distinguished people beside you today. Where? You, oh, sorry. Your council member, members. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, just be. Um, I'd like to acknowledge them on online. Um, he mihi aroha kia koutou katoa. Um, yeah, if you'd like to introduce your guest or at least say hello. <clears throat> hello, greetings. I'm Donna Cohen. I'm Skanako, and um, I'm the tribal counselor and advisor. And uh, my uh, family um, goes back to about the 1600s. And um, I'm actually pr- very proud that I and, you know, us here are still here well and alive. And um, we have an important role right here on Turtle Island, right where we stand in our roots, for our ancestors that have passed to um, bring all tribal nations together and uh, work side by side with one another. Because if we're supposed to be the example for the so-called society here, um, how can we be an example if... um, each tribal nation is fighting within themselves. Oh. That's no real example at all. So mm-hmm. now's the time to come together for, especially for our next seven generations, mm-hmm. so that we can have a better today and tomorrow for them. And, um, you know, I, I know things are going to move forward from here for our land. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, mm-hmm. It's not going to happen a year from now. It's going to take time. You know, we, we can't jump into something real quick and, um, you know, say, oh, geez, you know, we made a mistake. Can we go back and fix it? Because we won't be able to. So we have to really, um, you know, move forward in a way where we can look at all our avenues, take our time, and make the right choices and not jump and rush into things. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm in total support of Chief Fox of uh you know, not going with federal recognition. Um, I don't believe that's the way either. And uh, that's just my my opinion. Um, that I, just I don't agree think that's with you. The way to go. That's all right. Yeah, hold on. I know. I I I know that my great 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 grandfather Dragon Canoe never had a card. So why should I? Mhm. Exactly. Right. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Wow. So then we have we also have here um our tribal clan mother uh Meg Gentle Dear Birch and uh I'd like to introduce her or she can introduce herself here. Hi everybody. Hello. Hello Yoda. I just wanna say thank you for standing by us and letting us help you while you're helping us. That's, that's how it has to be today. Yep. 
And if it had been like this all along, then we we would be much much further along than we are. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, this is a this is a very good opportunity. I appreciate like um, you guys allowing me to be on the show. I enjoyed being on the show last time, and, and I know we're not done yet, but I just wanted to say thank you. Well, you know, this is a this is a good platform, and it's like the name of our show, Indigenous People's Voice, and we welcome people to come on and talk about what's going on in the different communities all over Turtle Island and all over the world. You know, this is this is where our people have a voice. And what we're talking about tonight has reached out across the world. And other indigenous peoples are listening to this too, not only here in Turtle Island. And this is the best way for our people to get the word out there and what's going on in Indian country, you know, here and as for other indigenous peoples around the world because, you know, mass media is not going to cover it. No. You know, <laughs> no. No, and so, you know, I am thankful for modern technology and my Buffalo Hide computer with the Buffalo toe keys and the beadwork insignia on it because that's the way we get our stuff done in today's world. Hmm. There you are. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Okay, we have about five minutes left here. Um Is there any, like, uh, closing thoughts or comments anybody would like to make, even the, even the people with your counsel there, uh, Hawk? I would, um, well, I, first I'd like to say, you know, I'm really looking forward to the, um, the conference coming up in September. I'm looking forward to hearing what, our indigenous people, brothers and sisters, have to say this week about the zero draft. Um, very excited about what we've come up with so far with the uh, the NDRIP, the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, and um, I am so proud to be a part of it. I'm so proud to be able to work with with you guys on this, and uh, you know, I think people should really. Take some time, check out what's going on at the UN. Uh, take, uh, they have the website. You can download all the documents, um, and uh, and see what's going on. Be a part of it because you know we're fighting for something very important. You know, for Indigenous people across the board. You know, this mm-hmm. is going to affect us all, and and uh, you know someday. This is going to be this is going to be a practice that happens across the board, and I believe that even even in the U.S. it it, it could happen. So, you know, if you're not a part of it, you know, you're just along for the ride, and and uh, I can't be along for the ride. I can't do it. Definitely. <laughs> um, not you. I, I'd like to um, just acknowledge you, Hawkstorm. Thank you so much for um, coming on the show with us today. I, I, I'm, I feel a little bit privileged that I've met you and you know, got to know you a little bit. Uh, I can see that your peoples are going to be in good hands with you. You have a, a very, very broad overview of the world that you're living in with your people uh, and the international, the global world, you, you have a really good understanding of what's right and what's not right for our people. Mm-hmm. So, kia kaha, kia maya, kia manawa nui. Um, just be strong, um, be steadfast and be true for yourself and for your people. Uh, hold fast to the your tradition because that is what makes us who we are as indigenous people that makes us unique our traditions, our song, our ceremony and our dance and our language 
So, um, yeah, kia kaha. And I'm looking forward to the journey that's ahead of all of us mm. because we're all intertwined at the moment. Mm. So, kia ora koutou katoa. Carl, do you have anything you'd like to add before we pick off? Oh, um, just just want to reiterate what Doreen has said. Um, yeah, Hulk Storm, I think your people are in really good hands um, with you at the helm. Um, you know, we're all there to support you, as, as are many other Indigenous brothers and sisters. We will get through this, and um, thank you very much for being allowing me to be part of this um, radio show. So I love it every time I'm on here. Thank you all. And thank you guys very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm glad to have met you guys too, and I look forward to a lot more work together. Good, very good, very good. Yeah, um, I think I think we've made some friendships and connections that are, that are going to be with us throughout the rest of our lives, and I think that we're, as indigenous people, especially here on Turtle Island, are going to be intertwined and working together. And we have given us a better opportunity to see other ways to bring us into the 21st century and still maintain our cultural dignity and status and cultures amongst our own people because um, these are things that we don't want to lose in the process of moving forward. You know, this is this is what we've got to pass down to future generations. Um, and uh, thank you to the to the members of the Shadakul. At the Coke tribe that uh, are with uh, Hawk Storm and uh, on the show tonight. That's uh, really good uh, to see that. Um, I don't know. Are your are your people matrilineal like ours, Hawk? No, actually, we're actually patriarchal. Oh well, then you count your blessings because you know with us, our clan mothers and tribal mothers can take a chief out of position just like that. <laughs> She's looking at me right now. We can tell her that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say, Don't a daga hoin, Oganali Eli Nagida. Thank you for tuning in tonight, and good night, all our friends and relations. Good night. <laughs>